of Light of Life Ministries. I am Minister Nakia Troy, and I'm delighted to have you join us today for worship. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning just to learn more about you and be dedicated to learning more about you in this day. We thank you for allowing us to have a blessed week as we move forward and allow the message today to speak to our hearts in such a way that it ends up pleasing you. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, let's have a song from our praise team. Hey Amen. Is it okay if we let the praise begin this morning? Does anybody have a reason to give God some praise? We ask you to join in with us as we lift his name up. Amen.
Thank you, praise team, for that song to get us started and set the atmosphere, even in our homes. Now let's jump into the word. So walking gets a bad rap. It's like the lesser form of transportation or movement than anything else. But what's funny is that there's a time in life where we really celebrate walking. Think about when you've seen a toddler take their first steps and you get all excited. But then some point, walking becomes to seem like it's just not enough. You got to start to pick up the pace. But unfortunately in our lives, when we start to speed things up, we end up losing so much more. We've been tricked to think that moving fast is going to help us to complete more tasks, to have more time. But in actuality, we're really just getting more time to complete more tasks. The idea of doing things more efficiently by getting them done quicker and doing more things isn't always the most effective for our lives. Sometimes our relationships are struggling because we're doing so many things. Friends, family, even our relationship with God can be negatively impacted when we can't find the time to just slow down. I'll ask you, like the Apostle Paul, asked in the book of Galatians. You were running a good race. Who cut in to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who called you. And we're going to go deeper into Galatians chapter 5 today, but we need to understand a little bit more about the backstory. Author and teacher Elizabeth Woodson says that it's important for us to know the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. What's that mean? There was an original audience for what we have here in the Word of God. They spoke a different language than many of us speak. So we have to go a little bit further in understanding what they were saying and why they were saying it. Now, Paul visited the churches in Galatia three different times on his journeys going back and forth. And he shared the good news of the gospel of Jesus and how it could save both the Jews and the Gentiles and freely give them salvation if they believed in the finished work that Christ had already accomplished on the cross. So Paul had told them about this finished work, and now all they had to do was walk it out and believe in it. But somebody cut in telling them something totally different. The book of Galatians is Paul's letter to those churches in response to what was going on. The letter doesn't even start with the compliments and the well wishes that you might hear in some of his other letters to maybe the Ephesians or the Philippians. He calls the people foolish. You can tell that Paul is a bit frustrated. The letter opens with him saying he's shocked that they're turning away from God so soon and listening to another way. That sound like anybody that you might know that all of a sudden is listening to another way. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5 and read verses 16 through 25. Many of you have probably heard this passage several times. However, we're going to focus on something a little bit different. So I want you to really consider the audience that Paul is speaking to. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the past. Remember, Paul's already talked to these people before. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also 
walk in the spirit. Now there were folks called Judaizers who were coming behind Paul and all, he'd already told the people and telling them, yeah, what he said is good, but you still need to follow these other traditions and customs to really be saved. All those laws are the reason why Christ died for us. But here you got somebody coming behind what Paul is giving and saying, no, do this instead. Add this to it. You got to do a little bit more. It wasn't possible in our flesh for us to keep all the laws. And those who thought they were by their own merit were arrogant, conceited. They looked down on others as they ran from one law to the next, trying to point out what they had done wrong. Anything that you had missed, not them, but you. The finished work of Christ brought freedom from the law so that we could walk in the spirit. The works of the flesh that we just read in Galatians 5 had consequences by the law. Like what kind of consequences, you ask? Well, there's a familiar story in John chapter 8 that speaks of a woman who was caught in adultery. And just to be clear, let's take a look at that together. John chapter 8, verses 2 through 9. Now early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. We're speaking of Jesus here. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. All of them had to leave. All of them. These so-called leaders, even these so-called leaders couldn't keep the law when Jesus pointed it out to them. So if that's the case, how could they really expect anyone else to? They all needed freedom from the law. And that could only be done when Jesus died for our sins and God raised him up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that same spirit, we have the ability to walk in. If I'm walking in the spirit, I'm covered. I'm protected. I'm surrounded. Galatians 5 and 16 said, walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We live in a broken world. Temptation is coming but you don't have to fall for it. The lusts of the flesh, oh, they are coming, but they don't have to be fulfilled if we are to walk in the spirit, in the spirit. I want you to imagine yourself inside of it. If you are walking in the spirit, that outside stuff has got to go through the spirit before it even gets to you. So just because the temptation is coming, just because the lusts of the flesh are coming, they can't get to you if you are walking in the spirit. My office at work has a window that faces out to the place where students board their buses. And it's always interesting to hear at the end of the day during this missile if there's rain. Because the next thing I'm going to hear is a bunch of yelling and running. Students running out of the building trying to get to their bus. And usually the ones who are doing the most running are those who are not covered or protected from the rain. Mind you, running on a wet surface is probably not the safest thing to do. I don't know what it is about running in the rain. You wouldn't run when you saw a wet floor sign in a building. But you get outside and it's raining and people decide to run. Not a good idea. But they do it anyway. And when I think about that and see them, there's sometimes I have to work uh, later and I might have to stay after doing that storm to do some things. But you know what I do? I put on a raincoat. I grab the raincoat I have that's hanging behind my door and I put it on. And walking in that raincoat reminds me of walking in the spirit because I can go out and walk because I'm covered and protected while the people around me are running, going crazy because everything is coming at them. But I'm protected 
from the elements. The water rolls right off my back. It's just like circumstances in our life. When we go through and things are going on around us, we have a barrier in the Holy Spirit if we walk in it. That is our hedge of protection. Encourage yourself with the word of the Lord that says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against me in judgment I will condemn, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And our righteousness, our vindication, it comes from him, from him. Psalm 91 says, a thousand may fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand, but it will not come near us. We are walking in the spirit. We are covered. We are covered. Even in Psalm 23, very common, many of us learn to recite that even as children. Well, in verse 4 it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. We can walk in the spirit and not be afraid because he's with us. Do you understand that you're walking through that valley? If we didn't have him with us, I'm telling you now, if you're walking through death valley and he's not with you, you're probably going to be running and scared. I know I would be. But because he's with you, you have the ability to walk through these circumstances because we are walking in the spirit. We can stroll at a leisurely pace and trust that God has got everything under control. We're going to come back to Galatians, but before that, I want to take a look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. This is Paul still speaking to the people of Rome, and I just want you to see how consistent his message was to the people. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And this really jumped, uh, verse 4 really jumped out to me in reading this in my study time because the righteous requirement of the law, the requirement of it, what had to be done. You ever dealt with a requirement, something that had to be done in order to move forward and recognizing that you really couldn't move forward until that requirement was taken care of? Well, there's a requirement of righteousness here that we can accomplish in our own doing. The righteous requirement of the law had to be fulfilled through our walking in the spirit. It could not be done in our flesh. But because of that, because Christ allowed us to meet the requirement, we're able to walk in the spirit and walk in peace. Now you can just coast as you're going through life in those circumstances if we trust in him. I saw a movie about 10 or so years ago called In Time, I end, In Time. It's a story of a future in which time is a measure of currency. Those who didn't have much time move more quickly through their life. That was their, their money. They worked to get more time. So for them, time really was money. When their money ended, so did their time and so did their lives in this particular movie. Those with lots of time, they could walk slowly and enjoy life without any fear of it running out. They were trusting and content in the fact that they had plenty to spare. Walking in the spirit is like those people in the movie. They can trust and walk and enjoy life because we have the promise as believers for eternity, the promise of eternal life, that ours is not going to run out. It's not going to run out. So we have the opportunity to trust as we walk in the spirit that we can enjoy life. We can experience joy. We can experience peace 
We can experience kindness. These are evidence of the fruit that's on the inside of us because we are walking in the spirit. We can live in this peace. We can have patience just because we are walking in the spirit. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 5. In verses 16 and 25, both mention walking in the spirit. But the meaning of walk is different in each verse. Now, I want you to remember this was translated from the original language to the people, which was Greek. So just because in our English language it says walk in verse 16 and walk in verse 25, they're talking about something that's, that's different, and I want to show you the difference in the two. In verse 16, it tells us to walk in the spirit, and we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And in this verse, walking means to live, as if to say to live in the spirit, make it a lifestyle. Trade the life of hustle and bustle for a chance to slow your pace and just walk. Some of us might need to physically take a walk just to walk and talk with God on a regular basis. The benefits of exercise in that moment will be an added bonus to what you're going to get in your spiritual life just by taking that walk with the Lord, walking in the Spirit. Verse 25 you look down, it says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And here that definition is to walk in step, march in rank, get in formation. I want you to consider a marching band. Everyone conforms their own desires to move like a group. If you're in a good band, they're probably going to play some songs that you want to move and dance to on your own. But for the sake of the band, one band, one sound. For the sake of the band, you can form your flesh to do what everyone else is doing in order for the goal to be accomplished, to get the right point across. Your flesh wants to march to the beat of its own drum. But as you're walking in the spirit, there's unity. There's unity. There's love. There's peace. There's not contentions and dissensions. We're walking together. We're in formation with the spirit's leading. I was in the marching band in high school, and I recall being a freshman when I first got there and was learning how to march and how to make the formations and seeing what that diagram looked like on paper before we actually had to get on the field to do it. I was blown away at all the intricate details that it took to get that done. You've seen bands at games or on TV. They're making figures on the field and spelling words out. The only way the correct message gets across to the audience, though, is if everyone is in step and hitting their marks. Are you walking in the spirit so the correct message of Christ is actually getting across to the people that you come in contact with, your daily audience? If so, your walk should show evidence of love, not hate. Peace, not dissension and contention. Self-control and not outburst of wrath. All those negative things, those were the works of the flesh that we saw earlier in Galatians chapter 5. We instead need to walk in the spirit to allow those other things to flow. But we can't do that on our own. You know what you deal with in your daily life, and you know how challenging it can be for you. As we rely on the Holy Spirit, he allows us to be more like him. We can do those things because of him. You know who gets on your nerves and can lead you to a place where there's no longer peace, <laughs> lead you to a place where there's no longer patience on your own merit, in your own flesh. But that is why we have to walk in the spirit so that we can fight against those things and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our flesh will default to those things that we saw earlier in chapter 5. Our flesh will default to selfishness. It will default to envy and all those other things that are contrary to what the spirit says. That is why we can't rely on ourselves to get it done. We have to rely on the spirit. You don't have to try to be bad. You have to try to be good, right? You don't have to try to be bad. Thankfully, we're not trying on our own because we can't get the job done. We do not have the ability to fulfill the righteous requirement on our own. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Paul asked Galatians in chapter 3, verse 3, how foolish can you be after starting your new lives in the spirit? Why are you now 
trying to become perfect by your own human effort. What makes you think you can do this on your own? That's a very arrogant approach. If you think you can make it in these times, in this world, on your own. Can't do it. Can't do it. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And be honest with yourself enough to know that you don't have the ability to accomplish this on your own. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. We move too much. Things are happening too fast around us. And as we're trying to accomplish these goals and do these millions of different things, we recognize that, you know, we might not even be focused on what the Holy Spirit can do through us because we're trying to reach so many goals by ourselves on our own. And then we're frustrated when it's not happening fast enough. Or we're frustrated when things aren't getting accomplished, the things we've been working so hard for. The beauty of grace is that we're not having to work for it. We can rely on Christ. An acronym that I learned many years ago, I believe, from Bishop was grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. He's given us that grace to move forward in life so we're not having to run and chase every single thing. He's going to allow those things to come to us. All we got to do is trust him, walk in the spirit, and live that out in our daily lives. I know it sounds easy, and it may seem easier said than done, but we're relying on him to do it through us. He's the one that makes it easy, not us. His yoke is easy and burdens light is what the word says. He is. He makes it easy. We trust and rely on him. It probably is too hard for you. It is. Let that be known. We can be honest. But recognize that through him, we can do all things, right? Yes, we can. I want to leave you today with some verses that you can reflect on to encourage you to walk in the spirit and the benefits of it. Write them down if you feel like you need to but just be sure that you get it. To make it easier, these verses form an acrostic for the word walk. And what that means is the first letter of the first words of each of these verses spell out W-A-L-K. It's pretty clever, right? Thanks to the Holy Spirit. The first one we'll take a look at for W is Psalm, chapter 27, verse 14. And it says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isn't this an example of patience? That patience that comes from the Holy Spirit that's mentioned here, the fruit of the Spirit, patience is, is a part of that. By waiting on the Lord, we're showing that we trust in him, that we will wait on him to move on our behalf. Being of good courage is having the right attitude while you are waiting. He'll strengthen our hearts to allow us to be able to do it. This is how you're able to walk and not just run and chase stuff. We can wait on him. When you're running all the time, sometimes you might even be getting ahead of what God wants for you. If you run all ahead of him, he's no longer leading. He's no longer leading. We need to be waiting on him. And if that means slow down to wait on him, then that's what we should do. And in doing so, we're reminded here to be of good courage and allow him to strengthen our hearts so that we can wait for the things that he has promised to us and recognizing that what he has promised, he's also able to perform. Just wait on him and be encouraged by that. Next is Psalm 55, verses 16 through 17 for the letter A. As for me, I will call upon God and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. If you're walking with him, it's a good time to talk to him. Let him know how you feel. Let him know what you think of him. Let him know about your circumstances. You don't have to wait for a specific time of the day. This verse says evening, morning, and at noon. This is all day. You don't have to wait for your bedtime prayers to speak to the Lord. Share your heart. Talk to him. Let him know. And we have a promise here in verse 17 that he shall hear our voice. You're not just talking to a wall. You're talking to your Savior. You're talking to someone who loves you. You're talking to someone who cares. And because he cares, 
he'll move on your behalf. Just talk to him. Share your heart. Take that walk and talk with the Lord. Next is Psalm 19 and 14, for the letter L. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Many, many years ago, we used to recite this at the end of service uh, here at Light of Life, and I don't even think I knew that it was a Bible verse at the time. We were just saying what everybody else was saying. I was a kid then. But this verse powerfully says that we should let our words and the things that we're thinking be acceptable to our Lord. It's real easy for our thoughts to go haywire. And soon after our thoughts go crazy, the stuff we're saying will start to line up with the craziness that we're thinking. But we got to be transformed by renewing our minds and letting the mind that's in Christ be in us. If we're walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, our talk is going to be different. Our thoughts are going to be different. And if some of that temptation or those lusts come, it's our job by walking in the spirit to bring them captive, toss them out to change the way we're thinking and the things that we're saying. We have to do that. We have to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit to change those things. I heard a quote from the author John Gordon that says, uh, when those you know, crazy thoughts are coming up, don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. Don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. Because sometimes if you listen to yourself and some of the craziness that comes up that you're meditating on, boy, it could have you thinking of doing some, some wild things. Talk to yourself it's, instead. Reinforce the things that you know are true through the word of God, the truths that God has already spoken to your heart. Speak those things and allow those thoughts to conform to who Christ is and what he's already done for you. He is our strength and our redeemer, and he will allow us to move forward with the right thoughts and the right words. Let them be acceptable to him. And lastly, letter K, Psalms 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and sheep of his pasture. He's the leader that we are following. He is God. He is all powerful. He is all knowing. You are not. <laughs> it's he who has made us and not we ourselves. If we rely on him, somebody who's all powerful and all knowing, how can we worry about this other stuff? We're the sheep of his pasture. We're following him. He's got it under control. He's got everything. That's who we're relying on. That's who we're following. Not on our own power, not on our own merit. We're relying on him. He's got the answers to the test. That's the person that I need to sit by. And it's not even cheap. <laughs> He's got the answers to the test. Every one of our days was written in his book before any one of them came to be. He knows what tomorrow holds. He knows what the next few minutes holds. Let's walk with him because he's got the answers and trust that he will lead us and guide us and not try to go on our own way. Not try to go on our own way. We must follow him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. I pray that you receive something today in this message that stirred your heart. And I want to challenge you to be intentional in this week about walking in the spirit. God bless you. All right, Light of Life, can you tell me what time it is? It's giving time. Hallelujah.
thank you all for your tithes, gifts, offerings that allow us to continue to do the work of the ministry. We truly appreciate it, and God sees your sacrifice. Thank you for joining us today. I pray that something was said that could bless you and moving forward. And I want you to remember this. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. God bless you and have a great week. Make it right.